So it, it actually works both ways. So we have an old saying, you should not buy the pig in the bag. Uh, you need to see the pig first, so to say. Uh, but that goes both for, for the student and the company and the company and the student. So uh, the student can try to work with the company and see if it's a nice place to work. And the company can test the student to see if it's a person that not only can do things, but also fits into the team. Welcome to this episode of Goldcasting. Today we're here in Brescia together with Professor Jafosch and we're going to have an interesting discussion about university corporations. So why don't we start with our guest? Anders, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, why not? Uh, my name is Anders Jafosch and I'm a professor in material and manufacturing at the Jönköping University. I have a little bit of a mixed background here because I've been working at the Royal Institute for some time in metal casting and then I worked in uh, Singapore uh, for a while uh, working on casting again surprise uh, and uh, then back to Sweden working for the Swedish Metal Research Institute and then again back to Singapore and doing some things for the aerospace industry and since 2011 I have a professorship in uh, Jönköping University A university that is well known for collaboration for real. That is perfect. But before we dive into our main topic, what do you think? What's the main difference between Singapore education, Singapore working in Singapore, than to Sweden? Well, uh, that is a very difficult question. I think that Singapore has a smarter funding system than Sweden, so that helps a little bit. But on the other hand, the industry is not as collaborative as it is in Sweden. So we have a more open collaboration environment or attitude in Sweden uh, in that sense. Interesting. Okay. But our topic today is how to make money um, with university corporations. So could you start with explaining how the university corporations work with a company? approaches the university with a certain topic? Well, f first of all, the, the process is quite simple. We take money and make knowledge, and you take knowledge and make money, and that's the, the, the circle, uh, so to say. But uh, typically in Sweden, we, the Swedish innovation system, it, um, well, we have a base funding for activities from, uh, not really a base funding, but you can apply under competitive terms. Uh, for funding and the requirement is that more than 50% must be in terms of cash or contribution in kind from the uh, from the uh, industry and this is sort of the the, the scene which is set in Sweden um, and that means that uh, well, either I come with an idea and speak to the companies or the companies come to me and uh, suggest that we should do something together and in the beginning, it's often me coming out to the companies and then talking to them, get to know them and suggest that maybe we get a collaboration funded. And after a while, uh, like with Comtec here, we've been collaborating for quite some time, then the, the flux is uh, quite uh, both ways, so to say. It's open doors and we find things to, to, to work with. Two questions now. First of all, what is the meaning of the What, what, how can I contribute? And the second question is, how long does this process take? From idea to you actually have a result that you can make some kind of brochure and start uh, banging doors and you know, start to sell to make some money. Well, the answer to, to, to the last question is, oh God, it takes too long. And this is naturally because uh, the, the idea from idea to implementation is often much longer than you think but once the idea is there uh, the return is much bigger than you can think as well so that that's uh, that's one part um but, but the, the whole idea of, of collaborating is, is critical uh, so so once you start uh, collaborating um, you get the dialogue uh, going and it's very very important um, to have an engagement from the companies. They need to be involved heavily with the, uh, uh, with the activity. Uh, and 
this often takes a personal relationship that you find a collaborative partner in the company, not just the company as a partner, but the person to work with. And you not, need to have the right chemistry. And that's sort of the, the driving force. So one can compare um, the activities uh, in terms of what in kind is uh, with well, how the company approaches to do things in a project like this. Um, and in kind is a little bit different depending on which funding agency you get money from. But typically, uh, in kind is activities within the company uh, that are both physical and intellectual processes. So if you think about physical activities, that means that uh, we can do experiments in your equipment, you can give us materials and things like that. And th this is the hardcore um, uh, in kind, so to say. But the softer in kind, it involves, uh, well, first of all, direct interactions with, with uh, the, the project. So you go to meetings, you have discussions, you have phone calls. Uh, and a little bit depending on the which agency that is funding you, you have also a softer portion uh, where the process is inside the company. If you have activities tracing oxides in aluminium, for instance, and you have oh, continuous subject. improvement activities, that can also be part of that because that is part of the knowledge creation within the companies. And that activity, as you develop that, you can actually uh, count that as in kind because that is something you use in the discussion with the uh, with with the researchers and in the research project. So it's a relatively wide uh, discussion on on what in kind can be. But the the hardcore in kind is physical activities in your company, uh, travel and things like that. Uh, but the softer portion is often much wider. So it's discussions with us and also internal activities where you With use great things. You can use your own the hunt for offsides and you spend two years of it. Yeah, you can use that, I think. Absolutely. That's perfect. Yes. We have been very successful, I think. Yes. If, if we look at our collaboration, it's, it's 10 years now, right? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think this is a, a stellar example on, yeah. on how to act because, you know, often, well, people engaging university for the first time look at us as a consultant mm -hmm. and that means that that well you ask me a question and then you wait for the report that comes uh, three years later and then you're going to start implementation this is when you ask for a solution but when you work with a, a university you ask for knowledge mm -hmm. and that means that the first day in the project we can already deliver something that you can start to implement and this is the interesting thing to realize that, that in knowledge creation, you can start the implementation process from day one. You don't need to wait for the results. I see something totally different, but I'm, I'm, I'm also the sleazy sales guy. Uh, I see that you actually meet people. I mean, it's, it's an official project that we've been running. We speak about Scania, and track and companies like that. And the interesting thing is that they kind of start to share what design challenges they see three, four years. Mm. And, and that is also because of number one, if you have, have your, the right project, you can steer a little bit to, towards it. So you have an offer for the market because they're not that new. Uh, Scania has the same problem as Iveco, MAM, uh, Daimler, et cetera, and everybody making a track, same challenge. Uh, and you actually get this customer relationship on a totally new level. You don't need to talk with quality people or chasing the scouts from here. Other loose cannons. You actually speak with the people who are concerned about in five years, how are we going to build? And that's, I mean, that's the, the merits along the way. And then you get a lot of things. Second thing I see, you get a new contact network. If you're a foundry, I mean, in this country, in, in Italy, how many family old foundries do you think there is? Too many. They work with one customer, two customers, maybe three customers. They're doing more or less the same part. If they want to come out of, of this ditch that we call it because we see some troubles in the market, going to uh, Annalisa Paula, the professor here in Brescia, for example, mm. and then start something. Yeah, it will take you five years to, to get, mm. the, they will call it the result. Uh, you call it the knowledge. But the, during the way, they will actually lift themselves. They will rebrand the company actually mm. without paying anything. 
Hmm. So, so that's my view. But then the question, getting the funding. You know, in Sweden, there are two ways. Go to a university, or there are people that are even more sleazy than I am that offers the help to get the U European grant for uh, whatever. Uh, you always fail with those consultants, but, but we have been very successful. So, so here comes the question, how to be successful to get a project grant? God, if I really had the answer to that one, I would give it to you, uh, <laughs> but not in public. <laughs> it would probably yeah. cost me something. Yeah, no, but, 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 but this, is, this is really a process because it's a little bit like you or Jackpot. Uh, mm. It depends on what type of evaluators you get and such. But, but there are some fundamental basics. The first thing is that you need to have a consortium um, that is, um, well, uh, good constellation for the problem and th this is often written in the calls what do you the mean a good constellation for the cause i mean now we're talking about uh, uh, the hobbits and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no really so, so when you and i speak uh, setting up uh, a consortium means that that um, well, we have a core problem that you want to address and i have an idea on how to solve that uh, and then we normally work within your supply chain. So it's part of supply chain development activity in, in reality. And having a credible uh, consortium for the problem, that means there would need to be the right parties to address that problem in your supply chain. That is, is step number one. The other part, which is hard if you're new, is to have a track record to have oh, yes. a proven experience in solving these problems. What you're saying is call Anders. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's essentially the thing that, that <laughs> come, comes into play here. So uh, now we know how you make money. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, but but the, the, this is, this is the, the starting point. And then, well, reading the, the, the call exactly and then formulating it within the, the, the tolerable uh, uh, prescriptions by by the government is is the the basic fundamentals and and I would say that maybe sixty percent of all the rejected um, proposals they actually fail because of these uh, other things they take it for granted that uh, I know you don't know your history well enough mm -hmm. uh, and they take it too easy they look only forward and forget what happened so it's very hard for the government agencies to show what progress is intended in the in, in the proposal so, so that is really one of the big issues mm -hmm. in, in writing a proposal and then of course it needs to be the right people with the right experience and you need to to make sure that that not only the consortium of companies are okay but the the team constellation is fulfilling all the requirements and many many times uh, this is not a technical requirement because there are issues on, on gender requirements in the mm. calls and things like that. And sometimes in the foundry industry, that can be a little bit challenging. So the Italians have a, a good good situation with Annalisa Pola running the energy department. Like well, in, in the Swedish context, yes. 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 But now you said that for the team, it's quite important that it be a certain kind of team to be successful. Can you elaborate? What's the requirement? What types of people are needed in a team to have a successful project? Well, if you have a technical project, you need to have technical people from, from the companies and you need to have people with sufficient seniority in the team. Mm. Uh, you also need to think about growth because the, often there, there's a growth and replacement planning uh, thought in, in the calls as well, because we need to continue to be, have skilled people in, in the company. So that means there needs to be a balance between the senior and the junior people. And there needs definitely in Sweden to be a balance between men and women. Mm. But I, I think that in general, in order to have a good solution to a problem, uh, you need to have a diversified team. So you get all the perspectives and all the different ideas. And that means it's not only gender, which for at least from my perspective, which is important, it's race, religion, and all these other uh, geographical differences, because the, the requirement in Italy are not the same thing as the requirement in Sweden. So, so this is definitely something. But, but if I'm <clears throat> setting the scene here, our, our theory in this spot is that high pressure die casting has been quite successful from uh, 1960 
871 somewhere where it really took off and then you have a straight line up to diesel gate and then we see some problems we see also the development of evs <clears throat> if, if you don't believe in evs today i think you should leave the business uh, even if i don't drive an ev but there Fabian is you know here he's here a, he's the morning guy <laughs> kind of like to smell the diesel but yeah i will quit but if i am a foundry and i believe in our the picture we are our painting here that one has to do something one has to actually act <clears throat> we understand that this is a three to five year journey we understand that we will get some benefits along the way in marketing and branding new contacts etc but i have no ideas can i walk up to a professor and say that hey i got foundry here i would like to do something or do i need to bring the idea to the table no i can do that you can do that <laughs> but yeah that's that's one of the questions. The se second question is, we are working in Sweden with, with you and your team. That's very successful. But are there European collaboration that one can, can follow? Because sometimes you can see a, a question that you're interested in. The industry is interested that this question is on a broader scale. But could, could you work with, uh, let's say, here in Brescia together with this team? Or uh, how is the grant or the grants national? Well, the Swedish grants are, are national. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have international parties in the in the projects uh, well, for the Swedish funding, but they cannot get the Swedish funding. And it's not counted as contribution in kind unless the company has a headquarter in, in Sweden. Uh, but they are definitely welcome. I have examples where we have Swedish funding and German companies, mm -hmm. uh, but they then well, they can provide some value to, 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 to the project in terms of in-kind activities, but they are not counted for the funding. So you need to have that, so to say, made in Sweden and they can't get any money. But in terms of business, this is something that, that uh, if you're developing something and they are an end user, that means that um, as an end user, you can get benefits already to work with your supply chain. So, so the benefit is direct but it's not counted from the funding agency standpoint. <clears throat> you can tag along. All right. So as a sum it up, you need to be find a university within your country to apply to, to get funding for your project, but you can bring outside parties of your supply chain to it. Mm. So basically you can have a com common project with your companies deliver to you. Or you can take your customers and say, hey, we want to improve our project or our product and then sell it to our common OEM. Is that how it works? Yeah, more or less. It's uh, like any business process. <laughs> I would like to, to kid one thing. Uh, again, when you speak about development, you, you end up in a discussion about grants directly. And when you discuss this, especially around the uh, Eurogas, uh, a pub, a bar in Germany. There's always a bunch of guys that think that if you're doing it the right, with the right way, with the right professor, you can uh, get loaded with money. I would like to kill this because according to me, this is not a way to get money. This is a way to get results, branding, contacts, internal, external, and so forth. But do you see many gold diggers approaching and thinking that, yeah, if we get 8 million kronos for this, ooh, I got 2 million in my pocket. Oh, I'm looking at you. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I haven't seen any yet. I've been doing no, this for I'm, 15 I'm years. I'm terribly, terribly sorry for that. <laughs> no, but, but uh, not really. I, I haven't seen any, any gold digging in, in my business. It's actually much more that way. D difficult. Yes, I'm, 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 my life is a little bit as, as a priest, you know. I promise a, a future, a better future, if you listen to me. Um, but you have I, a pretty I, I, strong charge, I would say, in John Shipping. How many PhDs do you have and have doctors work? Oh, God, I had lost count. But it's 20 something, right? No, it's probably like something in that order of magnitude. Yeah. But now, uh, how many are working in semi -sol? Almost all of them. Oh. I think that, that it's uh, maybe 60% of those. I'm getting a little bit surprised. We, I mean, we're here in the conference about semi solid and I learned things that we apparently are doing in our own workshop. I saw on the, the PowerPoints yesterday. I, I, I absolutely no idea. Coming back to it, I, I think, again, being this Lisa sales guy here, but the results, the knowledge, all that is super good. But, but if you're a small foundry, what you lack in is the perspective. 
you have a forecast to your, your dear customer that tells you what to cast within what, 12, maybe 24 months if you're lucky. But you walk into a room with your customers and they actually start to discuss what they need in the future, three, five, 10 years from now. And, and if you're the owner of this foundry, this is highly relevant. Mm. Because if, if you're doing like, I don't know, diesel engine parts, I love diesel engines, but, but and they tell you that, yeah, the only thing we're interested in is electrical trucks. You know one thing, they will not spend a single krona, a single euro on the development of, of these parts. You will be hanging around with old parts in an old sortiment that no one is interested in. And where will this place you? But in the same time, they will tell you, ooh, we're looking for this, this kind of alloys, this kind of applications, this is the way it looks. You can match this, okay, what kind of die casting machines do I have? Mm -hmm. I got 700 tons, they're looking at 2,000 tons. I may, maybe I need to make an investment or de-invest or whatever I need to do. That's one thing. The second thing is, I'm going to be rude to some listeners now, but because many companies are small, they're family around, they have four to, to eight die casting machines, and they are living with a lot of... Uh, thinkings. This is the way to design an in-gate uh, overflow a vacuum channel and this is how we do it in the state of simulation. They run the fam, you know, in the tooling and all of a sudden you enter a room where people actually know something. They have mm -hmm. done research. They know about metal speeds and blah, 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 blah. And they're killing your ghosts, probably. You, you mm -hmm. will get a, a totally different knowledge. And, and the Chinese have a wording, when is the best time to plant a tree? And it's today, or 20 years ago. So why do you wait? Mm. It, it's better to actually approach the university and start a discussion. Do you have an idea? I don't have an idea, but their professor might have a couple of good ideas. Okay, who's interested in that idea? Well, you know, that's customer A, B, C, D, E. Ooh, mm. let's go. Yeah, we get to peek over the fence for many companies, so we have an idea on, on where trends are going, actually. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a part of being a good part of being a neutral party in, in a discussion like this. Mm -hmm. So you get basically insider knowledge with your customers or with your whole supply chain by entering such projects. Yes, but, but you know, you, you can't uh, share the information because there, there are contracts and things like that. But, but, no, but you mean, if you get them within your project group? Yes, well, what, both current and previous, of course, what's inside my head, I can use that, but I can't share the, the detailed information. But what I have seen and the experience that comes with working with somebody that has been in many different houses, I know something about what's in those houses and that I can use to interpret how to solve new problems. And th this is really one of the benefits. But uh, as you say also, the, the, the whole part of having a project like this is to provide an arena for peeking over the fence and talking to, to the other parties, not on an executive level, but on a strategic level. And it's interesting that strategic because I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, that for a project with the university that you have to plan like three, five, six years ahead, what is coming to us, where do we get the knowledge? Many companies that don't engage properly with university, they are looking at what can we do with the university that is, is good to have but not necessary or not critical. <laughs> and the closer you come to the component, the more critical it is and often the more close at heart, it's necessary for the company to keep that knowledge because that's how you make money and make a difference. But, but somewhere in between good to have and absolutely critical to have, there's a huge scale where you can engage the university. And I, I think that the best way to do that is to have something which will be necessary not in a too distant a future, but, but actually um, in a five-year perspective. So something that's troubling you, not now, but you know it's coming. And then you basically say, okay, I'm going to talk to someone who knows how to gain new knowledge and have a strategic process how to attain new knowledge. Yeah. And I, I think to, to be very, very frank now, uh, almost all the problems that we encounter are things that you're struggling with now. But in five to ten years, you're not allowed to struggle with those problems anymore. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really the issue. So, so we solve your, your, the problems that you have today, but, but you're not really 
well some some you are bothered about but but not mm. all of these all these issues uh, and and i think that is very very important and i i think that we see a fantastic example today where you have uh, new requirements on castings mm. and you're going to use castings in larger and critical parts that means they need to be repairable, weldable, and all these things. So you can't have porosity. Porosity has been around forever and will stay in the castings. The question is, how do you make porosity not harmful? So today, a lot of you have that as rejects, but in 10 years, you can't have them because you, you can't do weld repair after a crash, for instance, in, in a large casting. Yeah. And, I, and I love when the customer comes to us, we have five every week. Three of them say, it should be leak tight. Mm. And our first question is, how do you mean, what do you mean, and how do you define leak tight? Mm. Are we speaking about helium, etc.? I would like to change the subject a little bit. You are, you are a global traveler in, in, in die casting development, others. Uh, what kind of trends do you see? It's, well, <laughs> it's a very open question. We can speak about technology, markets, yeah. the customers. I, I would say it's it's twofold. One is driven by the climate. Well, actually, both are driven by the climate. But but the first one is that is driven by the climate is the use of recycled material and uh, carbon dioxide footprint. That is definitely something. And it's the same thing as energy efficiency. And what people don't understand that carbon dioxide footprint and energy efficiency both are money. Mm. It's on the on the last line. If you're more energy efficient. You, it costs less to do the casting. The other part is an increasing size, and that comes, um, uh, well, not of the castings, maybe not of the machines, but it comes from functional integration in the automotive industry, and it comes from larger parts in the uh, telecom industry. Those are absolutely of paramount importance, um, and that creates new requirements on design, new requirements on toolings, new requirements on machines, and new requirements on processes. Mm. And I need to test something on you. When I worked in the foundry industry in 98, we started to move our supply chain to China. It was cheap, cheap, cheap. Uh, quality was, hmm. In, in 2000, 2010, we saw that the quality from China was equal to, to the one in Europe. And now I'm in a conference where I see very good researchers from China presenting very advanced stuff. Are we going to be bypassed technology-wise by, by Asia? Yes. Short answer. It already happened. Yeah. And why? We are complacent. Okay. No, it, uh, there, there is nothing else because, well, uh, Hans Rusling is a phenomenal man. Uh, unfortunately, he died too early. But the educational understanding from Hans Rusling is that what we've been taught in school when we were younger mm -hmm. is no longer true. And we have a hard time changing that mindset. And we don't realize that, uh, that there is really no, no difference in this. So old attitudes are very hard to kill. I absolutely agree. Uh, trying to see if we also agree on the following points. In Europe, we work North America, we work Europe, we work Asia, uh, China, India, all these countries. I have a feeling that in Europe, the only thing I'll find is committees, budgets. It's more important to, to do things in the right process, even if the result is wrong, than mm -hmm. to actually have the good result, uh, but maybe bypass a couple of toll gates and be a little bit more entrepreneurial in Europe, that mm -hmm. is, or more specific, German car industry. Mm -hmm. Is this something you recognize? Yes. Absolutely, because uh, well, we've been well. I've been living and working in Asia, and what I know is that uh, the Asian businesses are much more impatient than the European businesses. Mm. So they may get it eighty percent right, and then for the next round of toolings, they they correct the mistakes in the first round, so to say. Mm. In in Europe, it's um, do the right thing right the first time right, mm. even if you're too late. Even so if you're too late, yes. So it's basically a waiting around because in Europe we know it anyway and then we do it perfect the first time and by doing it perfect we lose all the time and get left and right overtaken by Asia. Yeah, absolutely. Waiting for perfection takes forever. I had to challenge another thing. Uh, 
I, I love this that uh, we're sitting in Italy. Uh, when you go to Eurogas, you meet a lot of uh, German uh, uh, car makers and tier ones, and they always laugh about Tesla. But if we look at Tesla, uh, the first Giga casting looks pretty shitty, if you ask me. Uh, a lot of flash and things, but he builds the cars in what, 12 hours instead of 24? Uh, then people complain about his metallurgy properties, and then boom, boom, he starts to have IP rights on new alloys. Uh, he exceeded the expectation of, of, of the point of profit with nine months. He's the most valuable car company, and still people say, yeah, but he has a bad elongation in that section of the Giga casting. Is Tesla to be seen as a role model in casting, or how, how should we regard him? Well, Elon Musk, I. I love the guy. <laughs> I have to say He's that. He's my best marketing manager, yes. by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I agree. Too. Because when I started teaching uh, uh, and lecturing uh, in the late uh, 1980s, my first words in the, um, in the, in the lectures was, uh, casting is a good process because it allows functional integration. And the only one that appears to have listened to me is Elon Musk, yeah, even though I never had him in my classroom. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? Because he seems to be all over the place. Yeah, no, but, but he's done fantastic for, for the business and he's uh, causing a transition. Hmm. But, but, you know, if, if you look at the electric cars, everybody talk about the Tesla, but 50% of all the sold cars are in China. Hmm. So China is the leading country for, uh, for electrification, mm. no doubt. And then we have Europe, and quite far behind is actually the U.S., may, with maybe 10 or 15% of all the cars. Uh, but if we... Um, I have to, to... Electric cars, that is. Yeah, and I, I mean, you see BYD and you see Honshu, they are in Arland Airport when mm. I flew here. They are in the Gothenburg Airport. You see mm. them all over. You see them in TV commercials. And by the way, you see the Aura car, yeah. equipped with real casting, by the way. Mm. Mm, yeah, it's going the right way. But... My impression, bullshitting about Europe now, just waiting, doing things correct, but ending up with a result too late. North America for me is more active. And, and I, I used to love the Americans because there is no, no people that are that good to, to get into trouble, but they are, more, they are better getting out of the trouble than we are in Europe. They're more action driven. So, so what we see from our small market perspective is that they actually dare to do things that we don't do in Europe. Mm. But they start from a super low level. Yes. So that's also. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, it's it's. Um, yeah, I, I think it's true, and I think that the choice of action shows that that at least some of us in Europe are doing the right thing. Uh, uh, uh. How about India? Because what I heard about India since I, I went to metallurgy school in the nineties that India is coming, it's booming. It was Indian Brazil and. <laughs> It was the same sentence in the same room, you know, you said that next uh, album from Madonna was going to flop, but, but uh, these things never mm. happened, yeah. regardless. Uh, Skill-wise, there is nothing wrong uh, with India, <laughs> but there is an infrastructural issue. Uh, mm. It's all about the transport and the logistics mm -hmm. that is, is really a challenging, and that's what is different between China, because China has gone for high-speed rails, good roads, yes. and all these things. So the logistic support system is phenomenal in China in that sense, mm. uh, while uh, India has struggled a little bit in, in, the, in the development. And that is why it's going a little bit slower in India. Mm. But you believe in India? Oh, it will definitely come. And we, with all these, well, there are geopolitical changes where the IMF is being ch uh, challenged by the BRIC countries and, and such. Mm. So, so with different... Uh, systems and I, I truly think that we will have uh, a transition from a G8 or G7 or whatever we want to call it mm. to something which is brick based mm. because all the people are living uh, in the east. But why don't you think that we discuss this more? Because when you're sitting with the category management team, it's, it's very easy that we bullshit a little bit about Tesla and the, the crap equality, and then we say we are doing everything right, and here we have a, a, a shock tower that's going to save us. But that's not true, right? It, it will, the, the truth for the future is something else. It's a more, more entrepreneurial approach, mm. a la the Chinese way, that you actually buy a machine and then you sell the capacity. Mm. Eight out of ten, you're, they're actually pretty successful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And well, if, if you look at it, we have, well, 
there's no surprise that we are in Brescia because Idra is here and those are the suppliers of uh, yeah. machines to, to Tesla. So, so that, of course, is, is the European stellar example here. Uh, but uh, if you look in China, there are several companies that actually produce these machines also. And uh, it's just flooding the, the Chinese market. Mm. Uh, with with large machines, so what we see here as as a breakthrough has happened uh, already quite some so time ago. So we're a me too, is what you're saying? Yeah, well, it, well, we are definitely not the first player. No. Oh. Yes, and that must hurt. I mean, uh, people are pretty proud here. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> or in Switzerland, yes. to mention another one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was a really interesting discussion, especially seeing it on a global scale and circling back to our main story. When you're just a small foundry somewhere within Europe, what is the main advantage with working at a university? Is it more like knowledge or is it more like getting access to skilled people? Well, uh, as uh, as we have uh, seen, uh, well, the purpose of a university is... Um, essentially to create new knowledge and then transfer that to to the society's best interest, so to say. And um, we do not um, sell something that you can transport in a truck. The main consumer, the first line consumer is, is the students. And that can be a master project, it can be a PhD project. Uh, and that is how the main bulk of knowledge is being transferred from the university to the industry in terms of people and employees that have skills and capabilities. Then the next part is what we train them with that is given by the collaborations with the industry uh, so that we are current and do the right thing. Uh, but, but the actual first part is that we should generate people that can work for the industry. And as you well may know, if you think about somebody doing a PhD, 80% um, will, well, I would say 100% of them actually would like to become a researcher. Uh, but maybe only 20% survive the selection process because it's not uh, an ice cream <laughs> function, so to say, to be a researcher. But 80% goes to, to the industry in the end. And th this is really the value uh, of working with the industry because if you need people you can either get an engineer and you can try them out in a master thesis project or you can collaborate with the university in a phd project either as a university phd you can work with the, with the person or you can have an industry phd person where that works at your company so that you get trained staff as well yeah that's amazing because everybody if you talk to the companies, oh, we don't have enough skilled people, we try to find them, nobody wants to work for us. Mm -hmm. Basically, you're saying is start a university project and you're the first line of people finishing the degree, I don't know if it's a bachelor, master's or PhD, and then, oh, I already know the company, I worked with them, they're nice people, so I will go to them. Or Yes. So it, it actually works both ways. Uh, we have an old saying, you should not buy the pig in the bag. Uh, you need to see the pig first, so to say. Uh, but that goes both for, for the students and the company and the company and the students. So uh, the student can try to work with the company and see if it's a nice place to work. And the company can test the student to see if it's a person that not only can do things, but also fits into the team. And then there's also the word of mouth, because if the first three people went to company X and others should say, hey, I know these guys, hey, do you have an internship? What about that? And then... That's the level how you get new people yes. without spending fortunes on some headhunters to get the entry-level position. Yes, absolutely right. Yes. And that is uh, why, why we are here. I think so. Yeah. Mm. So, gentlemen, I would say thank you for being here, Anders. Mm. Thank uh, you. Pleasure. And uh, we will see each other many times more that I'm pretty mm. sure of. Uh, and for your listeners, mm. we will be back in two weeks from now with uh, yet another episode about money, profit, and how to deal with the future in the casting industry. So, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Goodbye, and just a light reminder, reach out to your university, contact them, and start getting your people five years down the road already now. Thank you, and goodbye.